In the last couple of years, Chinese churches have increasingly been torn down. Others have been forced to close. The government there has tried to slow the spread of the gospel by dismantling buildings and organizations. Brother Joel is in constant contact with believers in China, and he says it's very clear the church is much more than a building. Here's the attitude of our Chinese brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, they took our church away from us. They took our Sunday school away from us. We'll find new ways to preach Jesus everywhere we go. <laughs> and the church is genuinely excited about getting out into the culture. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. This week here on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio, we are going to focus on China and on the church there. I'm Todd Nettleton. I'm joined today by Brother Joel for his protection we're just going to use that one name. Brother Joel has been with us here before. You can hear those conversations in the archives at vomradio.net. Brother Joel is a key part of the work of the Voice of the Martyrs in China, especially as it relates to distributing Bibles in every single province of China. We're speaking at a distance today because of COVID-related travel challenges but I am so glad that we'll get to hear from Brother Joel. I always appreciate his knowledge and his thoughtfulness as it relates to the church in China and the challenges of persecution there. Brother Joel, welcome back to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for having me today. It's a great blessing. Well, we are thrilled that you're with us. You know, right now, one of the first questions I ask any part of our international ministry is about coronavirus. Uh, China in particular is interesting with this because it's the first place we saw an outbreak. How is coronavirus affecting the church in China? And maybe more importantly, how is the church responding to the pandemic? Uh, first of all, the effect on the church is similar to any other place in the world in the fact that they can't meet together. Now, that this has driven the younger part of the church to go onto the internet and they use Zoom and they use social media and they try to meet together as we're doing in the United States through social media. But the older folks who can't get that technology or are just don't respond to it well, they're feeling very lonely. So they feel disconnected from the church. Uh, there have been reports, many reports of pastors dying and uh, church members dying, although I would say not a large number. It seems that God has protected the church in a very unique way in China. The main way I believe that the coronavirus has affected the church is their desire to use this pandemic as a way to preach Christ. So immediately, even though the church members have lost their jobs, most of them, and they're sequestered in their home, they're doing everything they can to start new outreach programs. So they're finding families who have been affected by COVID-19 and they've had a death or a severe sickness, and they're meeting their physical needs. They're trying to get food to them. They're trying to get financial aid to them as much as they can. So there's a big social outreach Secondly, there is uh, a spiritual outreach, psychological spiritual outreach, where they're just talking to people. And, you know, uh, in this virus, uh, people around the world are feeling depressed, they're feeling lonely, and the church is trying to fill that void and fill it with Jesus. Finally, I would say that um, there's been somewhat of an uptick in persecution during the virus. The church thought this would be a time when the government would be so focused on the virus that they wouldn't have enough energy or time or people to focus on persecution of the church, but apparently that has not been the case. I've heard at least one story of, of a church in China that uh, sort of used the masks as a, uh, they, they know about, obviously, and, and we've talked about previously, the 
facial recognition software and the cameras that are everywhere. And uh, this particular church said, hey, everyone's wearing masks right now. Let's go out and use this as an opportunity. I, I'm happy to hear that it wasn't just that one church. Other churches as well have seen coronavirus as an opportunity for the gospel. Yes, even if they had only a few masks, people who I'm connected with and people who are on my staff, when they could get outside. Now, people were not permitted to go outside very much, but when they could get outside, they would use every few minutes they could to stop people on the street and say, do you need a mask? I only have 10. I'll give you one. And I'd like to tell you about Jesus. And so it's just tremendous the way the church has used this for evangelism. Uh, I think there is a lesson there for American Christians as well. Every, uh, every crisis comes with an opportunity for us to reach out and share the gospel. Brother Joel, uh, one of the questions, and I think you can help our listeners understand, is why is the Communist Party so concerned about the church? Why are they so concerned that even in the midst of a pandemic, they would spend energy and spend effort on persecuting Christians instead of fighting the virus? Because the first commandment to all Christians is that our loyalty goes to Christ first. This goes back to the days of the Roman Empire. The emperors of Rome really didn't care what God you worshipped or how you worshipped him. Just as long as you build an altar to the emperor first and do sacrifice and give honor and praise to him, if you give him your first loyalty, then you can do whatever you want after that. And this is the issue with the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, especially since President Xi Jinping has been in power. They are demanding that every citizen of China commit their first loyalty to the Communist Party of China. Christians will never do that. The government sees that as them being dissidents. They're not dissidents. They're not politically active. They're not trying to overthrow the government. They're not demonstrating for democracy. They simply say, we will obey and love Christ first. And that really scares communists. And I think there's a perception that, that President Xi himself is sort of leading this effort, that he personally is very opposed to the church. Is that your sense too? Is that accurate or, or is this more broad than, than him sort of spearheading it? That's exactly correct. This is the brainchild. This idea is the brainchild of Xi Jinping, which started in 2012 when he became the chairman of the Communist Party and the president of China. And he used a, approximately the first five years to, under the guise of an anti-corruption campaign, he began to get rid of all of his enemies. So he started with, first with the Communist Party, and he arrested, tortured, and disappeared about a million of, of his own Communist Party members. After that, he turned his face toward every part of the society of China. He went into the schools, and he took the textbooks and removed every inference, every note of foreign uh, history or foreigners at all, and he made it all about China. So worshiping China, worshiping the Chinese Communist Party, I should say, is his number one goal. And so he must persecute Christianity because they're the last holdouts. You used the word worship, and I want our listeners to understand, <laughs> you're not kidding, <laughs> that literally that there is that sense of worship. We had a picture in our magazine earlier this year of a woman literally on her knees at an altar in front of a picture of President Xi. So you're not joking when you say he wants to be worshipped by the people. No, the churches that are left stand, all the uh, three self-churches, they've removed many of the pictures of Christ. They've removed the crosses in place. They've put pictures of Xi Jinping. And they are required to open their services by singing songs of praise to the Communist Party, songs of praise to Xi Jinping, songs of praise to China as a nation. So this is nationalism on steroids, and it is true worship. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the new laws, because I know they put in some new regulations early in 2018. They have put in some more new regulations in 2020, earlier this year. What, what changed because of those new laws? 
mostly, and I'm still translating the newest laws for 2020, but mostly it's more direct acts of worship. So to my understanding, it's more of what I just explained uh, about controlling the actual worship and the message that goes from the pulpit, more restrictions on what can be preached. You know, one of the things we hear of from the Communist Party is, well, if the, if the church would just register, they wouldn't have persecution, there wouldn't be a problem. Well, we're just asking them to register, and, and oftentimes they'll point to the American church. Hey, you guys register for tax-exempt status, so, you know, it's, it's just like that. What's the reality as far as registration? What does it mean for a church to be a part of the three-self movement? What does it mean for the pastor? What kind of sign-off does he have to get from week to week on, on his activities? Okay, so first is the entire concept of registration. And we've heard about this for years. There really is no such thing as registration of churches in China. Traditionally, there is the three-cell patriotic movement that is the legal church that is controlled by the bureaucracy, the government bureaucracy, which controls religion. Now, if you're in the three-cell patriotic movement, you must report to that government agency, that atheist agency, every week. You have to submit uh, your sermons to them for approval. And believe me, there are brilliant people in think tanks around America who have studied this, and they, they have assured me that, yes, the sermons are being monitored and they're being censored every week. So this government agency, whose name has changed in the last several months, they control every aspect of the church. Now, you don't register with the Three Self Patriotic Movement. You join and you become a Three Self Church. The only other institution is the house church. The church in China was founded as a church in a family's living room. That's what they call it, the family church. Uh, when things were loosened up a little bit, then other people started to come in among the family. So it was several families. And when things loosened up a little more about uh, the early 2000s, then they began to rent commercial office space and put what, what looked like to us real churches in this commercial office space. They were not registered. They were not three self. And so they still called their self family church, Jiaotin Jiaohui. Well, that became a little bit uncomfortable for some people. So they started to call them the unregistered church. If you call them the unregistered church, that means there's a process of registration. But I promise you, we've studied and studied this. There has never been a process for a family church to register their church. So there's never been a registered house church. You only, the only thing you could do as a house church is join the three self movement. And it's important to know that difference because over the years, Western church leaders listening to the government of China and trying to cooperate with the government of China very sternly condemned and scolded the house church leaders and said, you should just go ahead and register. Look, we all register in the United States. But there was no registration process. We went to government agencies. There's no office. There's no form to fill out. Since February 1st, 2018, the law says that every church that exists must register with the government. Every church has already registered in the context of telling the government this is where we are. This is who our leaders are. This is what we teach and preach. But we will not be controlled by you. So if registration means filling out your form of who we are and where we are and what we're doing, they've already done that. That's registration. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Joel. He helps Voice of the Martyrs deliver Bibles all over China so, Joel, we've talked about these new laws and new regulations. What has happened to the church since early in 2018 when the first set of these regulations took effect? How has the church responded or what has that meant for them? I'm going to give some statistics that are uh, not from detailed research, but they're just what our co-workers and our staff are telling me is their perception of what's happened in their country. In the beginning, just before February 1st of 2018, 
the government threatened the church and they said, we're going to shut all of you down because all of you are illegal. Every non three self patriotic movement church is illegal. So you're going to be shut down. So the church planned for that. Approximately 50% of them voluntarily closed and divided into small groups of 10 to 20 people. About 30% of those who were left were violently attacked. And this happened in a manner like this. They would be in the worship service. Suddenly there would be 100 or 200 SWAT team members surrounding the church. They would go in and take the pastor, normally torture them. One friend of mine and his wife were beaten bloody, their hands tied behind their back, tortured with tasers. And all this was done in front of their fifth grade son. And then they're taken to prison for a while, taken to jail for a while. And everything in the church was either sold or destroyed, and the church was confiscated. So 30% of the churches in existence had that happen to them, and about 20% still remain open. So what's happened is the majority of the family church, the house church of China, has returned to the true model of the family church. They're meeting in small groups, 10, 15, 20 people, usually no more than 20, in a very small apartment. And that is the true church of China today. About 20 people being run by someone who's not fully trained as a pastor. Some others are using NGO organizations. They're organizing themselves as an NGO, and that's a cover for their church meetings. Now, the positive to this is that the church is surviving and is being blessed. The negatives, of course, is that there's less fellowship, less cooperation. There's less funding for missions. There's, there's less cooperation for all projects. Also, the giving in the church is very difficult. Funding missions is very difficult. Uh, thirdly, the level of training that these home meter, meeting leaders have is less than adequate to be a pastor, especially in the area of systematic theology. So uh, the church has been really restricted. So in one sense, they're, be, they're going back to the purity of their original roots, but it's questionable if that's a good thing or not. We can look at that and be nostalgic, but there are some real negatives to that. Yeah. If a church is closed down and they divide into house groups, do, do those groups have some kind of hierarchy and, and some kind of leadership above them? Or is it kind of each group is pretty much on their own? Well, it depends. Some of the pastors that led them are not now able to be supported by the churches because they've been scattered. And the collection of offerings and support of a pastor is much difficult, more difficult. So many pastors have had to return to secular work. And so the other thing is to be able to meet with these house church leaders is very difficult. So I would say it depends on how well the original organization was, how strong was the original pastor? Does he have the ability to hold them together? Or if he's not a very strong pastor, maybe he doesn't have the ability to hold them together. Do you have any sense of, of why that 20% that has been pretty much left alone and they're still operating, is that just to, to show the rest of the world, hey, look, we're, we're not actually persecuting because, look, this church is still open? Or, or do you have any sense of why they're leaving those guys alone? I don't. What I know is that every locality, every small town, every city, the, the police leaders uh, and the religious government religious leaders of that area, they have to prove to Beijing and they have to prove to Xi Jinping that they're doing their job. So they have to close violently a certain number of churches. So I don't know if they just don't have the heart to close them all and if they're finding excuses to keep some open. I think that in most cases, this is just the providence of God. Well, God has certainly looked out for the Chinese church over the years since the Communist Party takeover, when when a church is closed, and we talked about some of them go into small groups, if I'm 
just a regular person in the church. What is my experience of that? Is it somewhat organized that, hey, we want you to be in this small group, or am I kind of left on my own to find my own way? Or how, how does that work for the person who maybe is, you know, they just attend the church, they're there one Sunday, they see their pastor get arrested, and then what do they do the next Sunday? Well, it depends on the believer. For most of these churches, they had a plan beforehand. And they knew who the leaders were going to be, and the people had already divided up even before the persecution came. That was a settled issue for the strong churches or even the moderately strong churches all across the country. So I think it's pretty well organized. So almost like like we do a fire drill, they had a plan in place for if, if there's a raid. If our pastor gets arrested, Correct. here's what we're doing. Now, the sad part about that is that, as in every church, there are strong believers and weak believers. And so for a new believer who does not understand persecution in the Christian faith, many of them can't cope with this, and they've returned to the three self-patriotic movements. So the only way that they can cope with this is to run away from the persecution and try to join the government church. Uh, some will, as the word of God says, some will be choked out and some will stop following Christ. The majority do not. The majority are strong. But this is the reason why at VOM we, we worked for about a year and we created a module of education in Mandarin language for these house church leaders to teach in their churches about the theology of persecution. And we're distributing that to house church leaders all over the nation in 31 provinces right now. Uh, preparing the way and strengthening the church, certainly a, a huge part of Voice of the Martyrs ministry. Brother Joel, are there blessings that the Chinese church is seeing? Uh, we talk about the new laws. We talk about the increased persecution. But are there, are there ways God is working or blessings that you see in this sort of season of suffering that's going on right now? Yes, and the greatest thing is they suddenly decided, I don't know how exactly to describe this, it's almost like, well, they took our church away from us. They took our Sunday school away from us. We'll show them. We'll find... We'll find new ways to preach Jesus everywhere we go. <laughs> We've had many meetings about how to use NGOs and different methodologies. And the church is genuinely excited about getting out into the culture. You know, if you don't have a church, there's no place to hide. <laughs> That's one way you could look at it. And so they're stuck out in society with no church doors to go into, and they have to have their church with them every day. And so there is, I believe, the biggest thrust of evangelism that they've had in probably 30 years, I believe, is beginning to happen right now. Praise the Lord. Even in hard times, there is fruit to be found. Brother Joel's been telling us about some of the challenges and some of the amazing opportunities happening in China right now, in spite of a pandemic, in spite of a wave of persecution against the church. We didn't have time to share our full conversation with Brother Joel, so he's going to be back next week so we can continue telling you how to pray for our brothers and sisters in China. And in the meantime, you can hear more from Brother Joel. He's been our guest previously on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. You can hear those conversations at vomradio.net. Just click on the search icon, search for Brother Joel. He distributes Bibles on behalf of the Voice of the Martyrs throughout China. He has many amazing stories to share. You can hear every past episode when you visit vomradio.net or search for VOM Radio in your favorite podcast app. Many of our brothers and sisters in China face intense pressure to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And that pressure can begin at a very young age. Some teachers, even in elementary school, have been known to line students up along the walls of their classroom. And then the teacher goes one by one and looks at the child and says, Did your mom and dad talk about religion? Do you ever talk about Jesus? 
Are you a Christian? I hope you'll be back with us next week to hear Brother Joel share the rest of that story right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.